Take one. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to October 30th, 2010, the day of the Christ Episcopal Church Stratford Graveyard Tour, second annual. Uh, your host tonight is William Samuel Johnson, signer of the Constitution, and your foremost forefather, if you're, if you're from Stratford, that is. Um, now, William Samuel Johnson is uh, pictured right here, in case you'd like to see a picture. How does that look? Small. Small? Shall I hold it up closer? How's that? Ah, we need our director. Director? Oh, that, that's good. That's good. Okay. And that gives you an idea of uh, exactly who you're listening to circa 19, 1793 when I was president of Columbia College towards the twilight of my career. I was born in 1927, October 7th. Um, 1927? 1727. Thank you. No. Yes? Fact checkers. October 7th, 1727. <clears throat> and uh, my father was Reverend Samuel Johnson of Christ Episcopal Church, first rector. And my mom was Charity Nickel, uh, who was a member of the prominent Floyd family of New York. Um, she was a young widow when she married dad. Uh, I was uh, put right into schooling at a young age because Samuel Johnson had boarders, uh, children who, who stayed with him and for a fee uh, uh, were able to get their grammar school education while living at the Johnson household. And so I was put on the fast track. Being the uh, teacher's son, I started Latin at the age of eight. I began Greek at the age of 10. I began Yale at the age of 13, and I was out of Yale at the age of 17. Woo! Thank you. I graduated with distinction. Now, for the next three years, I did a lot of self-education, self a lot of self-taught reading. Um, I did some missionary work to help Dad out in Ripton, Connecticut. I made a trip up to Boston, Massachusetts. And at the end of that period, uh, at the age of 20, I received a master's degree from Yale and an honorary master's from Harvard, the trip to Boston. <clears throat> well, being 20 years old, I cast about for a career. Dad wanted me to go into the church to be a divine. I wanted to uh, go into uh, soldiering, be in the army. Um, the way we compromised it was, I looked into the law. Now, Dad thought that was all right. Dad thought lawyers were, quote, limbs of divinity, unquote. And so, uh, boy, oh boy, the set is moving all around here. <laughs> limbs of divinity. <laughs> I'm trying to get a grip. And as a result, he, he approved of my going into the law. He, he bought some books for me. I was able to, again, self-teach and make great progress. The competition in the law back in those days was none too strong. Let me uh, give you an extract from something I wrote back in the late 1740s. Quote, in our pleadings and arguments, our practicers are obliged to rely upon their own imagination and draw from their own stock, oftentimes a most miserable resource. Here, a teeming, fruitful imagination will make the best figure. So, uh, you see that the law was not a uh, highly developed, formalized system in Connecticut. And somebody who actually drew upon the resources of a classical law library from England was going to have a head start. And indeed, I became known eventually as the father of the Connecticut Bar uh, because I raised the bar uh, through my studies and I may add through my uh, honey-tongued oratory, through my pleasing address, my gracious delivery, my uh, noble bearing and chiseled features. 
As a matter of fact, of my three biographers, uh, we have Eben, Ebenezer, uh, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Beardsley, 1876, and Professor Gross. Uh, oh, that, that's parchment. Oh, parchment. Sorry. You, you disturbed the parchment. Professor Gross in 1937, a Columbia professor and uh, a doctoral student at Columbia in the mid-1980s. Um, the, the first one, Ebenezer Beardsley, described me thus. Mr. Johnson, gifted with every external grace of the orator, a voice of the finest and richest tones, a copious and flowing elocution, and a mind stored with elegant literature, appeared at the bar with a fascination of language and manner, which those who heard him had never even conceived it possible to unite with the technical address of an advocate. And so, that was the Samuel Johnson who went into practice law in the late 1740s. And, by the way, I should mention, while we're on the late 1740s, marriage in 1749. Um, and I, perhaps it could be well summarized by a letter a friend wrote to me. He said, I heartily congratulate you upon your marriage with a lady whose fortune though it has made a considerable accession to yours, did not so much recommend her to your choice as those virtues and graces which made you esteem her the ornament of her sex. So you see that I married for virtues and graces and not for money that had no part of it. Now, um, as my uh, career progressed, I found myself doing all kinds of service I was in the lower house of the legislature for the state of Connecticut, then to the upper house. I served on the bench in the judiciary. Uh, I was a delegate to conventions. I was an agent for the state overseas. I made a trip to England between 1767 and 1771, in which I sat in on parliament, observed, reported on the temper of the times there for Governor Trumbull. Uh, my main job there was to represent Connecticut in a lawsuit against the Mohegan Indians who thought that uh, they had reserved a tract of land for themselves which was being kept in trust through the descendants of uh, a, an old-time governor of the 17th century, John Mason. But that's a long technical story. Uh, at any rate, Suffice to say that the elders of Connecticut were highly satisfied with my performance. The trip to England endeared me to the people there. I met bishops, I met statesmen, I met lawyers, I met parliamentarians. I received an honorary degree from Oxford. Well, I, re I received two, a master's and a doctorate. And uh, I went through life known as Dr. Johnson after the uh, 1760s. Well. Um, of course, the revolution was brewing up. I uh, went to the Stamp Act Congress. I was one of the three wordsmiths who worked on the document known as the, quote, Declaration of Rights and Grievances, unquote. Um, my felicitous phrasing was uh, called upon uh, to, to make a respectful address, a conciliatory address to the king. Um, unfortunately, that, that didn't work out too well. As the uh, coercive acts and the intolerable acts and the Townshend acts and any other acts you can think of started coming down the pike, um, I myself uh, sided with the colonists in spirit, but I did not want to get involved in uh, actually uh, radicalizing and uh, tearing away from the mother country. So what happened is uh, as, as time went on, of course, I was elected to the First Continental Congress on behalf of Connecticut, but I declined. I said, no, thank you. I resigned uh, my, my uh, status as colonel of the militia. I just took it easy in Stratford for a while, laid low in the tall grass, while some others might claim that they were pledging their families, their lives, and their sacred honor to the cause of American freedom. 
and I was idling away in my beautiful library. But uh, I, I did try to conciliate. I went up to Boston and visited General Gage after some of the bloodshed there, and uh, I was arrested. I had been sent up there by people who wanted to promote peace, um, and it wasn't appreciated. Uh, fortunately, uh, w when I was arrested, I was turned over to people who recognized who I was, that they had sat with me in, in council chambers, you know, on judicial benches, as fellow delegates, etc., and they released me. Um, I went back to Stratford. I idled away four years. And then in 1779, there was more trouble. General Tryon set fire to Fairfield. He sacked New Haven. And so the folks of Stratford approached me and they said, William, can you talk to your old Yale buddy, General Tryon? And I knew General Tryon, but I also knew that talking to another English uh, general was not what I wanted to do. So I circulated a petition to be signed by the folk of Stratford, promising that they would indemnify me against anything that might happen as a result of this uh, peace mission. Um, that I would make to General Tryon. It never got anywhere. I was arrested again. This time I was uh, sent for detention in Farmington. The folks in Farmington looked at me as a hot potato and passed me on to the Sons of Liberty Committee that sat in Lebanon. There was Governor Trumbull, uh, for whom I had worked while I was an agent uh, in England. He was an old friend of mine, a lot of other, uh, a lot of other old cronies. They released me after I signed the Oath of Allegiance. The Oath of Allegiance enabled me to uh, start in again as a lawyer. This is uh, 1779. Well, the end of the Revolutionary War came. Passions began to cool down. But to tell you the truth, things were never quite the same for me. For example, uh, it can be noted on uh, in the footnote to one of my books here that uh, George Washington and I, for example, had a somewhat frosty relationship. Um, Benjamin Franklin famously did not forgive his own son for being a loyalist during the Revolution, and it's uh, hard to believe that he would forgive me. Although, Ben did uh, host me for dinner one night at the Constitutional Convention. Well, anyway, before we get ahead to the Constitutional Convention, because you'll be wondering, how on earth did this guy, who was a loyalist, ever get so far ahead in his career? Uh, let's return to the early 1780s. And what brought me back was uh, the Susquehanna controversy. You might remember this from history books. It's one of those footnotes, but maybe. Um, Connecticut had been given a charter in 1662, which gave it the land out west going to the Pacific Ocean. Well, uh, Connecticut never said peep about this land until uh, for a hundred years. And then all of a sudden they were interested in the Wyoming Valley in Pennsylvania. And uh, many uh, people from Connecticut went and settled there. And so a dispute arose between Pennsylvania and Connecticut. Well, uh, I was the foremost authority on this subject. I was the best lawyer. And so I went and I represented Connecticut, although I adv advised uh, Governor Trumbull that we shouldn't pursue it. Uh, still, there were, there were leaders who were very hot under the collar about it. We did our best. Uh, the, I think it was the um, Articles of Confederation Congress that ruled against us, but we tried and I was restored. My, my career was off and running again. So uh, I was back in business. I, I, I represented Connecticut in the Articles of Confederation Congress. After that, uh, it was on to the Constitutional Convention, where the thing that I am most famously associated with does make the history books, the Connecticut Compromise. I was uh, one of, uh, I think, three Connecticut delegates who proposed the current form of the, uh, of the Congress with, with the Senate having equal representation of the states, and the House having proportional representation according to population of states. And that was a compromise between the state of Virginia and the state of New Jersey, 
who I think had a dispute on that score. Anyway, um, 